Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, we're going to be tearing down and assessing the repairability of the Google Pixel 6 Pro. In my usual fashion, I've purchased two brand new devices to take apart. Not just so we can see the insides, but so we can swap parts between the two phones. If you haven't seen any of my other teardown and repair assessment videos, this might sound odd, but companies have been increasingly locking parts to individual phones. As we saw with the iPhone 12 and 13, even if you swap parts from two brand new phones, the phone afterwards doesn't function correctly and disables many functions of the phone. With the Pixel 6 Pro rumored to have serial locked cameras, I took it upon myself to find out. With the black Pixel 6 out of the box, it's time for the cream colored one. While I like the overall design of this phone, I'm not a fan of the two-toned color scheme that even the black phone has. Since Apple removed the charger and headphones from the box, other companies have followed suit. This now includes Google. While I still think it's done just for profit, Google has been shipping a USB Type-C brick since the Pixel 2. So if you're upgrading from another Pixel, chances are your power brick will actually work with the included cable. Before we take these phones apart, I'll first set them up and add in a fingerprint. As the Pixel 6 has an underscreen fingerprint reader, we'll need to test if it continues to work after the display is replaced. With both phones set up, we can view their system information. Both are Pixel 6 Pros running the October 2021 security patch. To begin, I'll place the first phone on a heat plate for five minutes. With the screen being the entry point, we need to take care when removing it, making sure it doesn't get damaged. To ensure this, a pick with a maximum depth of three and a half millimeters must be used. This one came with those free tools you always receive with foam parts. It has a ridge that begins at three millimeters, which will be perfect. The pick can be slid down the sides and top of the phone horizontally, cutting through the adhesive and releasing the six snaps, also securing the display on. At the bottom, the pick must be inserted at a 75 degree angle to avoid damaging the display's flex cable. There is a plastic border running around the perimeter of the screen, but it's still possible to damage the display by applying too much pressure around this area. Once free, the display can be lifted to the left to reveal its one cable. Before I proceed, I'll power on the phone to see if the screen still works. With it still working, we can continue on with our teardown. I'll first power off the phone once again and open up that screen. After unfastening one Torx screw, the display bracket can be removed and its flex cable can be unplugged. With poor clearance, I found it was best to come in from the rear of the cable. And with that, the display can be detached from the phone. Getting a closer look at that display, you can see a cutout for the proximity sensor next to the camera and the inbuilt fingerprint reader. Proceeding, it's time for the other Pixel 6. Its screen can be removed using the same method. While having to remove the display to get inside the phone has me tenser than Google's tensor chip, the adhesive is quite weak, purely for water ingress protection only. The display's snaps are what actually is holding the screen in place. It's nothing when compared to previous pixels that have their displays separate in half when you attempt to remove them. With the display up, we can remove that one torque screw and bracket before disconnecting the display from the phone. With both screens removed, we have our first look into the Google Pixel 6 Pro. The main internals are still blocked by a heatsink and graphite sheets, so that's what we'll remove next. I will be carefully removing these graphite sheets. Ideally, you would replace these upon reassembly. However, as this phone has only just come out, there are no replacements, so I'll need to reuse mine. There is also a copper sticker going from the camera to one of the 5G antennas. I'll carefully peel that back, making sure not to damage it. Proceeding, the heatsink is to come out next. Oddly, the processor is facing the side you enter from, so the heatsink is not incorporated into the back housing, but is instead a thick piece of metal on top. While adding to the complexity of the disassembly process, it's also blocking the battery connection, meaning it's not possible to detach or attach the screen with the battery unplugged. I've heard many stories of people frying phones by not unplugging the battery. I can only hope the phone is designed so the display's connection is hard to short out. 
After the 5G millimeter wave antenna is out, I can unfasten the cameras and earpiece speaker. Three more cables secured in place, and once those have been disconnected, the entire assembly can be removed from the phone. These are some pretty big sensors. Let's hope they're not locked to the phone as rumored. The last thing we can remove for now is the earpiece speaker, as the battery is still blocking the removal of the logic board. Before we go any further, let's get the other pixel taken apart. With both phones partially disassembled, it's time to heat them up on a heat plate for 10 minutes to soften the adhesive holding in place the battery. Google has provided a pull tab for the battery. It's unlike any other I've seen. It's not glued or attached to the battery in any way. It's simply a piece of plastic running under the battery. You're supposed to place the phone in a clamp or have another person hold the phone while pulling up on that tab. But I had neither, so I tried a few other ways. Using one hand to pull up and the other to hold the phone sounded like a good idea until the slippery tab slid out of my hand and out from under the battery. So for this black phone, I had to resort to prying the battery out the way you do with most phones. The adhesive used here was significantly stronger than what was used on the display. While I'd failed on the first phone, I had a second chance. Using all the force I could exert, that battery didn't come free. Maybe the temperature on my heat plate wasn't accurate, or maybe these tabs are just completely useless. Either way, it was back to prying out the battery with good old plastic picks. With the battery free, it can be put aside and we can begin removing the logic board. Firstly, the front camera can come out, along with two more flex cables, five screws, and the SIM card tray. Finally, the logic board is free and can be removed from the phone. What we are left with is a pretty bare housing. Something to note is with the back made of glass, it's easily broken, but will be a real challenge to repair. Similar to the iPhone, the wireless charging module is stuck to the back, meaning you'll likely need to replace either the whole housing or be careful not to damage the wireless charging coil while removing the back glass. The last stages of the disassembly process will need to be undertaken on the black phone before we can swap the logic boards. With the logic board removed, we can see its lack of modularity. The USB-C port, microphones and proximity sensor are soldered directly onto it. While this complicates repairs, the phone still can be charged wirelessly if the USB-C port were to get damaged. One thing I'm particularly interested in seeing is Google's new Tensor chip. It looks pretty flash in their marketing, so let's get a look at it. Removing the thermal pad reveals a plain black chip that has no resemblance to any of Google's marketing. It's not even the same shape, but I suppose it's the performance that's more important. With that, both our Pixel 6 Pro smartphones have been completely disassembled. It's now time to see whether they can actually be repaired. Modular components are useless if the software disables the new component from working. To simplify testing, I'll swap the motherboard from the black phone into the cream one and vice versa, keeping all of the other parts original, meaning the only thing that's changed is the logic board. When I completed this test to the iPhone 13, we lost functionality to major components, including the cameras, display and battery. What will happen with the Pixel 6? Well, let's find out. I'll be attaching everything loosely back into the phone. It's important to attach the heatsink even if you're just testing, as the phone will overheat within a few minutes without it. After attaching the display, we can test out the phone. Upon boot, nothing seems out of the ordinary. No messages or warnings immediately appear. After entering the passcode and unlocking the phone, I'll test if my fingerprint still works. When trying to do so, I'm greeted with a message on the lock screen saying, can't use fingerprint sensor. Visit a repair provider or g.co slash pixel slash fingerprint unlock. The same message is now also displayed in the notification panel, 
the passcode entry screen, and when trying to set up a new fingerprint. However, this time it provides us with a little more info, stating enrollment was not completed. Visiting the link displayed provides no information on how to enroll the new fingerprint module. Instead, it's more of a general article on how to set up and use the fingerprint on the phone. But it's not all bad news because there is a solution. Before we get to that, I'll first continue testing. Lewis Rossman put out a video recently talking about a document on the Pixel 6 that stated the rear camera can only be used for the original device. After swapping the camera modules between the two phones, we can see that they are still working correctly. I tested all of the photo and video modes I could find. This included zoom modes, stabilization, night sight, slow-mo and portrait mode. They work just as they did before swapping them. While Google may calibrate the cameras when they perform repairs, swapping the camera had no negative effect. Coming back to the fingerprint sensor, we've determined it's paired to the display and is disabled when the screen is replaced. But there's a twist. Google has done something no company has done. They released the calibration tool. Going to pixelrepair.withgoogle.com, there are now two options, a factory restore and an install fingerprint calibration software button. It even states this is required when the Pixel 6 or 6 Pro display is replaced. To get the fingerprint calibrated, you need to put the device in fastboot and connect the phone to your computer, where it does the rest. In fact, you don't even need to download any software, it runs all from a browser. After about 3 seconds, the phone will reboot into Android. I had to complete this process twice, as it didn't work the first time. I was expecting to have to run some software, but it appears to complete the calibration on boot. After it's successfully completed, the fingerprint now works again just like you'd expect. Now that we've confirmed the Pixel 6 can continue to work without issue after swapping all of its components, we can reassemble the two phones back into their original state. Having done these tests, Google has proven that other companies are needlessly locking us out of repairing our own goods that we paid for. While the fingerprint sensor does need calibration after replacement, Google has gone to the lengths of providing it to the public on day one. This means whether you send the phone to Google for repair, a third party shop or do it yourself, you have access to use the tool to ensure the fingerprint will still work as intended after repair. While it's great to see, other aspects of this phone increase difficulty in repair, such as having soldered on the USB-C port or the glass back. With the original logic board back in place, I can install the front facing camera and the five screws securing the logic board into the housing. Next to attach is the earpiece speaker and front cameras. Proceeding, the 5G millimeter wave antenna can be placed back into the phone and secured with its retaining clip and screw. After installing the battery, the 5G antenna we just installed can be plugged in before the battery's connection. Lastly, we can attach the heatsink and its seven screws. Before we attach the display, I'll quickly reassemble the other Google Pixel with its original parts. For the battery, I'll be reusing its original adhesive, as it'll surely be strong enough to hold it down in place. After attaching the heatsink, I can reapply the graphite sheets. These are intended to be replaced after each repair, but I don't have any replacements, so I'll just reuse the original ones. I'm not sure why Google has placed these here, some say it's for heat transfer, but why would you transfer the heat from the processor to the battery? I will remove any residual adhesive from the frame before we attach the display. This is where you'd replace said adhesive. It is used to seal the phone from water and dust, as well as to help the display stay attached. As the phone has just been released, there isn't any adhesive I can buy to replace it. I'll have to come back at a later date to do that, but for now the clips will have to do. After attaching one display, it's time for the last phone. Its flex cable can be attached, along with its retaining bracket and screw. After wiping down the insides of the phone with a microfiber cloth, 
we can close up the screen and clip it down into the frame. Having swapped everything back, the display for the black phone now had to be recalibrated, as we calibrated it for the cream phone's display earlier. Again, I had to perform this twice before the fingerprint began to function again. After our phones have been reassembled and are fully functional, we're done. So this is it, the Google Pixel 6. While it might not be the most modular or repair-friendly phone, it's the only phone I know that has a paired fingerprint reader and lets you recalibrate it. This isn't something we should be grateful for, it should be mandatory. But thanks Google. Thanks for letting people have control over their phone, allowing them to unlock the bootloader, repair it, and really actually own it. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the Teardown and Repair Assessment playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.